I'm a 22 year old female. Okay, so this happened to me when I was around 13 though. My dad lived about 12 hours away, so in the summer when visiting, my mom would drive halfway and my dad would meet her in the middle to drive the rest. At this time, I was just coming home, so my mom was picking me up. We had around a six hour drive ahead of us and the sun was pretty low in the sky, so I'm thinking this was around 6 or 7 p.m. About 40 minutes into the drive home, I remember looking out the passenger side window to the car next to us. They were in the slow lane, but they kept right up to my mom's car. The guy inside looked to be in his early 20s. The thing that was really unnerving was that he was grinning at me. Not like a friendly grin, but like a maniac movie serial killer grin. He barely looked at the road and instead was turning frequently to stare at me. I turned to tell my mom about the freak next to us, but I noticed her hands were tight on the steering wheel and she looked really tense. I'm not sure how long ago she noticed him, but it must have been a while before I did. I told her he was freaking me out and she was basically like, yeah, I know, it's okay. We didn't talk much while it was happening. I think she was just trying to concentrate or something. For over an hour, he followed us on the highway. At one point, there was a lot of traffic, but he wouldn't back off and he kept right up with us. He always had a huge smile on his face. I remember being worried that he would wreck into us because he was hardly watching the road. Whenever he was behind us, my mom would tell me to look forward and ignore him. I kept turning around to see him. The worst though, was when he was on my side looking at me. I didn't want him to see me cry or freak out, so I kind of just sunk into the seat and I was hoping he would stop. My mom switched lanes a lot to try and keep him on her side but that didn't help much as he just kept staring and smiling. I really started to panic after a while and I kept thinking, what if he follows us home or runs us off the road? Luckily, up ahead there was an exit for one of those Native American souvenir stores with a cafe and gas station attached to it. My mom took the exit at the last second while the creeper kept driving. I was still freaking out, but my mom took me inside, got us some food and we sat and ate for a while. Irrelevant, but the food sucked pretty bad. We were facing the window so we could see out, but this car never showed up. After that, my mom took me to the store part to look around. I think to calm me down. I don't know if she called or talked to anyone, and eventually we left and I remember asking my mom what if he comes after us again, and she said that he wouldn't. We made it home safe and sound, and I haven't talked to her about it since. Two summers ago, on my way from an out-of-town day trip for my son's birthday party, we went to a water park and decided to go to dinner in this really small town after getting slightly lost due to Google Maps' crappy directions. After dinner, we noticed across the street that there was a county fair, so we checked it out for fun. It was getting dark and the fair was nearly over, but we caught a tractor pull that was about to begin. We'd never been to one of those, so we thought it might be a fun way to top off the birthday trip. We sat on the bleachers and watched for a while. There were a lot of families there watching and also a lot of drunk people as well. I didn't think anything of it. I had my 16 year old son with me and a good friend of mine who was a strong guy so I felt safe. We decided to leave the fair before the event was over so as not to be on the road at night with the drunks. We walked back to the restaurant which was now closed and we got into my car and set off for home. Backtracking using Google Maps directions, we got on the road that I recognized would get us back home. I noticed that as soon as we pulled out of the restaurant, there was a car behind me. The only other car on the road, as most of the town inhabitants were most likely at the fair or at home. The car followed us onto the road we took to get home, which I found odd because it was a desolate back hill road with a wooded area on either side. I thought maybe they too were from out of town and were using the same cut across to get to the interstate, as it was summer and many people road trip. I still felt uneasy about it, but I decided to just get off this road and onto the interstate as soon as possible. As we were driving on this hilly back road, it was fully dark outside and I kept it easy for fear of a deer running out in front of us. The car stayed right behind me, so I slowed way down, hoping he would just be annoyed enough to pass me for going too slow. But instead, he drove right up on my ass, tailgating me. 
I could see that it was only one person in the car and the windows were tinted. I dared to speed up, wanting to get on a main road or interstate as soon as I could. He stayed right behind me, going as fast or as slow as I was, not bothering to get off my bumper. I knew without a doubt we were being harassed now. I was getting scared. I mean, I had my son in the back seat, and it was his birthday. This was unfair, and I kicked myself for going to the tractor pull. Of course, I could not have predicted this craziness. After what seemed like ages, we got onto the interstate. I had hoped it was just some local jerk who wanted to scare some city folks, but I somehow knew it was not that simple. As I feared, he followed us onto the interstate. Even on the highway, he tailgated us. I slowed down initially, hoping in futility that he'd pass us. No luck. I sped way up. He caught up and stayed too close. Unfortunately, the interstate was quiet on our side, so I had no choice but to keep going. My friend was getting very angry and ready to fight if necessary, but I wanted no part of meeting this guy face to face, especially with my birthday boy in the back seat. I just kept going and prayed not to get a flat tire. At one point, I got scared enough to lay on the horn while driving, hoping the noise would dissuade him. It actually worked. He pulled over onto the shoulder and I saw his headlights turn off. I was relieved at first, but we found it odd that he killed the lights. After that, we sped up and I was flying for home. The sooner the better. About 15 minutes passed in blissful uneventfulness. We talked about how scary that whole ordeal was and eventually started feeling relieved to put it all behind us. Literally. Literally, we were about 25 minutes from home and there were a couple of vehicles here and there which made us feel less alone on the road. At one point when the cars thinned out and we were once again alone on the road completely, something happened that I could not believe. Right next to us and slightly behind us, headlights, bright, burst on. He had been following us that whole time with his lights off, staying carefully behind us and waiting for his chance to scare and surprise us. I almost started crying, but at this point I was too angry. This guy had been following us for an hour now. Far ahead of us, I saw the taillights of a semi. I sped up quickly with the stranger in the car next to me, trying to pace us from the fast lane. I think he realized that I was trying to catch up with the semi. So for the first time in this insane chase, he did something truly dangerous and swerved at my rear panel, a pit maneuver, trying to push us off the road. I sped ahead and missed him clipping me by inches. I finally reached the semi driver and got close, hugging the back of his truck as much as I dared and leaving no room for this jerk to cut me off. We went this way for a little while. Finally, and I truly believe this semi truck driver knew something was wrong, because after so long of seeing this crazy driver swerving at me and trying to get in front of me, as I would not let him over, the semi driver did something I will forever appreciate him for. He swerved over onto the fast lane and dangerously cut off the stranger's car and then tapped his brakes. I took it as my cue to speed ahead from the slow lane and try to lose this creep. I sped up to probably 90. My hometown was just straight ahead so I took a sharp left turn onto a back street that led to a main road and stopped in a busy well lit gas station. Luckily there was a cop there. My friend got out and explained the whole situation to the officer and he called for other cars to search for this guy. We left the gas station after calling a friend to follow me to a parking lot where I stowed my car overnight because I did not want the guy to possibly find my house by recognizing the car. I watched my back for quite some time after that and I always noticed that make and model of car in white if I see it on the streets. Thank goodness we got away safely. Now the most bothersome thing about this story is that the small town where this took place happens to be the hometown of one of the biggest mental health asylums in the Midwest. This thought has kept me awake more than once, and I still check the papers for stories or escapees. This occurred in 2009. I was 22 years old, and I was leaving my home state of California to head east for my correction job. I was driving down the loneliest highway portion of the route, and it was around 3 a.m. on a Sunday. They don't call it the loneliest highway for nothing. I hadn't seen another soul for at least a half hour. I was getting sleepy, but I wasn't tired enough to pull over and take a nap. Suddenly, I saw a broken down car on the side of the highway. I slowed down and saw a woman standing next to the car. 
So I approached this woman with caution, rolling down my window just a sliver. But something about her wasn't right. I couldn't put my finger on it then, but I know now it was my subconscious screaming red flag, red flag. I asked her if she needed me to call a tow truck or a AAA for her, and she immediately tried to open my door. I explained to her I didn't feel comfortable by letting her in, but I'd wait until a tow truck came. She immediately got this look of rage on her face and started berating me. You're a big man. I mean, what am I going to do? She was calling me cruel for not letting her in. This is where I messed up, and I can see this now ten years later. I begrudgingly unlocked my door. Figuring that she was right, I mean, she was 5'2", and I'm over 6 feet, and I have 100 pounds on her easily. She looked to be about 90 pounds or so. She slips in, and I asked her who I can call. This was 10 years ago, like I said, so I had a little Blackberry slide, I think, at the time. She starts telling me that she'd just prefer if I'd give her a ride to the next town. Now I'm starting to realize I'd done messed up, because she's avoiding eye contact, and she's fumbling in her purse. When I mention calling for help, she starts getting aggressive, demanding I take her to the next town. I'm so busy trying to unfuck this situation that I miss a man who either was hiding in or near her car. It wasn't until he was almost to my driver's side door that I managed to catch him in my mirror. Fight or flight kicked in overdrive and I put my car in drive and I sped off as the fucker was reaching for my car door. When I started driving, I heard a pinging noise and then my mirror exploding. He was shooting at me. The adrenaline alone had me doing near 90 and by this time, homegirl realized in whatever drug-induced state she was in that her little plan was futile. She started hitting me, telling me to stop and to let her out. When I reached enough of a distance, I did just that. I pulled over and demanded she got the hell out. She started going for the oversized purse she had, but I had enough. I was literally shaking with adrenaline, so I reached over, opened the door, and pretty much shoved her out. I tried grabbing for her purse, but she managed to hold on to it, not before dumping half of what was in there on my passenger seat. I sped off with my door still open. I waited till I got a good distance from her, and I slammed it shut and locked it. I clenched the wheel and I drove. It wasn't until later that morning I pulled into a Denny's did I realize how close I was to pretty much dying. I had a good cry for a minute, and then I realized a bunch of her things spilled onto my passenger seat. Most of it was nasty, wadded up napkins and a few tubes of lipstick and drug paraphernalia. I had considered calling the cops or finding a highway patrol officer, but I did do something stupid. I tossed all of her things that had fallen into a trash bag and I threw them away. At the time, I had the dream of becoming a cop and I knew if I got caught with drug paraphernalia, that would probably be impossible. I didn't think they would believe me that the drug paraphernalia wasn't mine. I noticed a cop at the gas station across from the Denny's and I told him what happened. He pretty much berated me for pulling over and then letting her in. He did say he'd look into it, but I doubt he did. I was so shaken that I pretty much picked at my pancakes and then left to continue on my way. I never did replace that mirror. I also ended up selling my car. To this day, 10 years later, I hesitate to stop and help stranded motorists. Context. I grew up my entire childhood without a father. When I turned 15, I got really into hunting and I just enjoyed guns in general. My uncle is an avid hunter, gun builder, and ammunition reloader, and he really loves to hunt. This was a common interest that made us become very close. He was a father figure, and he taught me a lot that made me the man I am today. So now to the story. My uncle's father lives in Montana, which allowed us to get resident pricing on big game hunting tags. Once a year, we would head up to his property and hunt for a week. Usually this would go seamlessly, and if we were lucky, we would get the shot we were looking for. Unfortunately, not this year. Just like every year, we headed up to his father's property in northern Montana, that night we headed out to go set up some hunting cameras so that we knew that there were deer in the area so we would know if it was a good place to hunt or not. It must have been 1am and we were driving down this two lane dirt road headed into the woods. We were always the only people on the road since it was usually so early in the morning. This particular time we saw headlights approaching from behind us but thought nothing of it. We figured that they must have been doing the same thing as us. 
After tailing us for some time, the headlights disappeared, which was strange since there were no turns on this particular road. A few seconds go by and all of a sudden we see the truck driving on the shoulder to our right with the lights off. The shoulder was a small hill with brush and a fence fairly close to it. Definitely something that nobody should be driving on. The truck speeds up and gets back on the road, turns its lights back on, and speeds off into the darkness. This set off some red flags for us, but we figured they were just impatient and wanted to get there before us. No big deal, I guess, or so we thought. We drove down the road for a few more miles until we saw taillights stopped in the middle of the road. It was the truck that passed us a few miles back. They had set up traffic cones to completely block off the road, and there was another truck parked on the shoulder. We figured that they must have broken down, so we stopped. I had read an article online earlier this year about people in other countries that would make roadblocks to rob and kill people for their vehicles and belongings. I laughed and started to tell my uncle about this article when two men from each truck jumped out of their vehicles and started to approach us. My uncle always kept two handguns on shoulder holsters under his arms when we were out doing these kinds of things, and this probably saved our lives. Two of the men stayed at the tailgate of the truck parked on the road, and the other two men came up to his window. At this point, my uncle had his right hand in his jacket with his hand holding his gun. The men were extremely friendly at first and said that the truck on the shoulder had broken down and that they were just helping him out. They asked if my uncle knew anything about cars and if he could come take a look at the problem. My uncle refused and this made the men angry right away. They both instantly drew pistols and one of the men rounded the front of the truck towards my window. My uncle then grabbed the man's gun that was pointed at him, which he forgot to load around into, luckily for us. My uncle pulled his gun out and shot the man on the shoulder and slammed on the gas, driving on the left shoulder, passing all of the men. I looked back and I could see the other three men gathering around the man my uncle shot. We drove and drove and drove, for what seemed like an eternity, without saying a word to each other. We drove back to his dad's house and he told me to go to bed. He called the police and told them what happened. They sent out two officers to the house to take his statement and mentioned to him that they had quite a few reports of roadblocks being set up all around northern Montana. They were actually able to catch all four of the men who stopped us that night and they took the man who was shot to the hospital.